Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Parker's Outfitting. talk to our very special guest today. Can you share something with our listeners that you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Yes, sir. Uh, Halloween is upon us, so I was happy to discover we have a vampire killing kit in our Enlightenment Gallery. I didn't know we had that here. That is one of my favorite things at Discovery Park of America. Um, It um, has actually been used to kill multiple vampires, uh, and they always come at Halloween, so that's good to know. So our really special guest today is Kim Bug. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. Nice to be here. So Kim has been, um, she not only is she a neighbor um, of us living over in Lake County. Um, Obion. Oh, are you in Obion? Yes. I thought yes. you were just right over, the, I thought you were right over the line in Lake. Oh, no, no. Then she's a fellow Obion County, and that, not that we don't love our friends at Lake County as well, but Kim is working with us on our upcoming Native American powwow. And so as we were planning and talking the other day, I thought, "Ah, why have we not gotten Kim on the podcast? So back us up a little bit. Um, Before we talk, we're going to talk about the podcast eventually. We're also going to talk about the exhibit that that we have um, that you uh, of your work, your artwork, which is really cool right now. Um, But but back us up a little bit and tell us a little bit about uh, your childhood and where you came from and how you grew up. Oh, goodness. Well, my name is Kim Bug, and I'm Oneida, Six Nations, from the Oshwegan area in Ontario, Canada. So my father was actually born in Canada, and I was born in California. And then as a child, we moved back to Memphis. That's where my mom is from. So I basically grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and I went to school there in the uh, Raleigh area. You know, had a normal childhood, I guess you would say normal Um your city life, you know, just going about your business, school, uh, extracurricular activities, you know, how many, art. How many siblings did you have? My sister is the only one. She's older. We did everything together. We're 14 months apart. So if if she went, I went. We just had um, a good uh, childhood, you know, walking to school, walking home, you know, and what, back uh, in the 80s. What high school did you go to? High school? I went to Bartlett High okay. School. Yeah, a lot of my friends went to Bartlett High School because, okay. you know, I'm from Memphis as well. So yes. Where, where did your parents meet? They actually met in college. My dad got a, a scholarship to come down here. And at that time uh, in his life, they had moved to Buffalo, New York. And so he was looking for a college and he was a really good tennis player. So he got accepted, you know, a scholarship to Memphis State, which is University of Memphis now. And uh, that's, you know, my mom was in a sorority. He was in a fraternity and they met and um, got married. Did uh, did he grow up on a, on a reservation? Kind of half and half. He basically in, in New York and they would go, you know, uh, frequently to the reservation. But he was actually born on the reservation and uh, I, early on in his childhood, they moved to New York. And when you were growing up, uh, did you connect with your Native American heritage or um, was that not something that had yet, you know, that that was talked about in your house or is that was that part of, of growing up or not? It really wasn't until um, about my early teenage years. So it, uh, you know, basically everything we knew, my sister and I knew that we were some kind of Native American and, you know, because obviously dad looks like it. And, uh, but we really didn't discuss it and we didn't do ceremonies. I mean, we grew up in basically a Christian family home. And so, you know, it was work, church, school, extracurricular activities. So, but, you know, I mean, when Thanksgiving came around and uh, school, elementary school talked about Indians, you know, they always looked at me and said, you know, there's the Indian. Huh. So, <laughs> so, so, so people did know that you were Native American. Yeah. Um, that was part of your identity, perhaps? Kind of, yeah. But I mean, if they asked questions, then I couldn't say anything about it because I was like, you know, I, I, I just know what I was told and we didn't really discuss it. You know, it was just one of those things where it is what it is and 
you just kind of left it as a, a normal and didn't discuss it. So at what point, what, what triggered your desire to start learning more about it and to get more involved? It was probably when my dad took uh, our family to a rendezvous, which is a reenactment of the Civil War era or the Revolutionary War era. And I just thought, man, this is great. You know, these people, you know, I never really did like reading in school, but I really connected with history when we went to Rendezvous. And Rendezvous was just one of those special places where I felt like, you know, this, I can imagine now, you know, what my ancestors were doing back then. So did you uh, uh, start doing research or when, once that spark had been had been lit, what what did you do to find out more? Well, I always asked my dad, you know, what exactly, you know, did our tribes do, you know, and, and it was pretty basic. And then I we started hanging out with more native people and my dad got into the native population, you know, by a coincidence, this guy ended up being at a gas station uh, after church one day. He'd always stop at this one gas station and get a paper. And uh, so he went in to get a paper and this guy says, hey, you're Native American, aren't you? And my dad was like, well, yeah. <laughs> and he says, well, we have a whole group of Native American community, you know, Memphis. And, you know, you ought to join, you know, and we'd love to have you, you know, and all this stuff. And so, I, you know, he was like, well, OK, you know, I'll check it out. So, you know, he he met a whole we met a whole bunch of people uh, that in that areas, you know, the Memphis area. And we became really good friends with them. And uh, so they, they started, they were already having a powwow down, oh goodness, a long time ago, it was in Germantown at the, I think, I want to say it was at a, um, a horse oh, arena. Yeah, the Tennessee walking horse. Yes. Uh, it had, they have a, yeah. a big uh, stables there and a lot of land. and Right. And so they, they did have like a, uh, an outdoor area where they had the powwow and so, you know, as a kid, we went there and uh, I just thought that was just the coolest thing. And uh, do you remember your very first powwow? I do. Um, I was and I still have the bracelet that my parents gave me. Uh, it's a, a little silver and turquoise bracelet and I always wear it. It's broken right now. <laughs> so I have to get it soldered. <laughs> so for so for folks but. who are listening, who have no clue what a powwow is uh, because I, really honestly until recently I really didn't know what a powwow was either so why don't you talk us through what does one experience at a powwow from an attendee's perspective but also what does someone who's Native American experience at a powwow okay so I'll take you back to the first powwow that I went to and um, it was you know as a kid you kind of kind of nervous because you're like, what are all these people doing, you know, and they're all dressed different, you know, they they don't look like, you know, us <laughs> and they're, they're dancing around and they're like, you know, what does all this mean? So when you, when you go and you see, there's a whole bunch of vendors, you know, like in the circle and they're, they're selling whatever they make. And you see all kinds of things like beadwork and silver and turquoise and you see um, ribbon shirts and like um, Native American regalia, like they're, they're dancing out there. And it's just a really cool experience because it's just like going to a new mall that you've never seen these stores before. And then uh, once they get the the dancing going, you know, then, you know, there's all these different categories. And so you have like a, a women's traditional and there's always these there's always um, history behind these dances. So everything means something to Native American people. And so when they go in the circle, they'll have like a flag ceremony and they'll bring in the flags and all the dancers will come in behind the flags and, and they're all dancing, you know, all in unison. It's just really spectacular. And um, they're very uh, spiritual people, too. So, you know, they always pray before, you know, we get into contest and, and things like that. So you'll have the flag ceremony and you'll, you know, they'll do a prayer and they'll honor their veterans. And um, they may call out certain veterans to honor them specifically. So then when... The dancing gets started. They'll go through each category. And my favorite when I was a little kid was the fancy dance because they dance really fast and they have these big, huge bustles on. And, you know, they, they just got a lot of feathers and it's just really athletic. And I thought, man, you must be really good if you can dance that fast, you know. 
but um, but they'll go through all kinds of different, you know, the men have their categories and the women have theirs and you go through those categories. And then, you know, when you're sitting there and you're, you're smelling all this wonderful food and you're wondering like, what is that? Because you're making flatbread, right? Yes, they're making Indian fry bread. So we got a fry bread, you know, when we were there and it was really good. The fry bread comes from the time in history when they put us on reservations. So, um, you know, the Native American culture is actually something they take a negative and they, they turn it into a positive. So the na- Native people were moving on with our life. You know, our culture is still alive. And that's what the powwow is showing you is that, you know, we're not just stuck in 200 years ago. And that's not who we are. And we do have resemblance of who we were. But here we are now, and this is what we're doing now. And we're celebrating our culture, and this is how we celebrate. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the Native American culture, the history of in this area. So um, I'm by f- very much not an expert, but what I do know um, is that for for the Native Americans two, three, four hundred years ago, our neck of the woods was hunting grounds and trading grounds. And if, if I'm correct in, in what I have read, there were not any necessarily tribes living here in Obion County or Lake County um, around Real Foot Lake, but they came and hunted and traded and, and trapped and, and things like that. Is that Yes, that, that is correct. And you got to realize that the, the landscape was different back then. So up here, it was more swampy and uh, it was perfect hunting grounds. You know, you didn't have really anybody settling on this land because uh, this is the floodplain. And I've, I've heard that Native Americans called it uh, the land that leaks. Yes, it, it was. And uh, so that's why, you know, when you see mounds, you go to the places like Hokie Mounds or or there's a mounds over there by Cadiz. You'll, you know, you'll see them. They're up on higher ground than what originally, you know, this land has shifted to where it's drier ground now. But it used to be a lot wetter than what it is. So, um, yeah, it's perfect hunting ground. You know, the the Chickasaw mainly hunted this area. And the Chickasaw are real close with, um, culturally, with the Choctaws. And they were down uh, Chickasaw. Oh, so hold on. What is that? Uh, Chukalisa. Yes. That's Chukalisa the- is in Memphis. And that is actually um, a mounds, like a Mississippian period mounds. Now, when you, you're, you're a lot younger than me. So when you were coming up at school, did they take you on a field trip? To, they did. You know, <laughs> did you really connect when you went well, on that? Well, I did in a way, but I always felt it was really awkward. Um, I really, that was the time period where they had, they had done an excavation of a mound and they had bones on display. Hmm. And as a little kid, I didn't know why they did that, but I felt really awkward and I didn't know why I felt awkward. But Hmm. then once I thought about it and, you know, I had, listen to other people talking about why they were offended by it. I said, you know, that's, that's exactly right. You know, why would I want somebody to go to the cemetery and and dig up my nanny and put her out on display? Well, no, you know, that's, that would be horrible, you know, and why are they doing that to my, you know, my family, my relatives, even though they're not the same tribe, you know, I was like, well, you know, that just hurts for, you know, the people that are descendants of them. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt, I felt that relation. So it made it hard, but it it was a learning experience. It made it fun to go there and learn about the, at the time, the uh, the Bells were running Chukalisa, and the Bells are really good friends of mine. Mm. So I've known them since I was a little kid in, in elementary school, and um, they are participating in our powwow. Oh, good. And this, you know, this year at the Discovery Park. So you'll get to meet the Bells, and there's a whole bunch of them. So <laughs> What's going on at Chukalisa now? Do you know? I haven't. Um... I believe it. It um, sometimes it's owned by the state and sometimes it's owned by the university. Oh, so okay. I'm not sure who owns it right now. Okay. 
it's kind of been passed back and forth. Uh, but I know that it's still there. You can still visit it. They do have a, uh, a museum there that mm. you can go in and maybe a little gift shop or something like that. But and yeah. Then there, and then um, there's also in Tupelo, I know there are some, you know, tribes whose headquarters are there, uh, where they lived was in around Tupelo in that area as well. Yeah. The, um, the Choctaws actually have their reservation around, uh, I believe it's Philadelphia, Mississippi. Reservation. That's the yes. word I was looking for. <laughs> reservation. Not headquarters. No. <laughs> the reservation. Okay. Yes. Reservation in the United States, um, they're called reservations. And in Canada, they're called reserves. Hmm. So actually, we're from the Six Nations Reserve. Mm -hmm. in, uh, and the reserve that we're from is over there by, I would say, in between Hamilton and Toronto. Now, I'm, I'm curious, and we're going to talk about Discovery Parks upcoming powwow after our break but i'm also curious currently we have an exhibit of your art when did you first start expressing your uh, heritage through artwork let's see uh when well the first time i went to that powwow i was seeing a lot of beadwork and stuff that i really really liked and you know as a kid you know always like mom buy me this buy me this you know and we didn't have a lot of money and there she was like no 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 you can do that you know you can make that and i'm like i don't know how to make that so you know as growing up you know we had what we needed you know but it, there wasn't a lot of frills and things like that so when my mom would would take us to she would she sewed a lot so she sewed a lot of our clothes and did fun stuff like that and she she's a very creative person so when we would go to like the fabric store we'd go to the craft store i'd go over there to the books and I'd, i'm like oh yeah there's a beadwork uh book so i'd look at the the book and i knew i couldn't afford to buy it so i'd look through it and i'll be like oh that's how i stitch that you know and that's how i put it down and so little tips like that you know kind of and, and i got beads from off of clothes, you know, that, that had beads on them. And I kind of worked and kind of played with that for a while until I, I really got good at it. And then, uh, you know, then once I started meeting other native people, I would ask them, say, what's your culture? You know, why do you guys do this? You know, what do these symbols mean? And, uh, so they would tell me and they, you know, they, they taught me the proper ways to use symbols and, um, how far back they went. And, and that just all tied in with the, the history. And I was just like, man, this is just the coolest thing, you know? And it's like, how come I didn't learn this when I was a little bitty, you know? <laughs> Now, now, also, I really like the corn husk dolls that you made. Those were really cool. They are. That's probably the most traditional thing that I make uh, to the Iroquoian people. Iroquoian is a language group. So not only am I an Oneida as a tribe, uh, the Six Nations are basically, uh, they speak Iroquoian. Um, so of all the items that are on display out there, what is your favorite? Oh, wow. I'm glad they're not listening to me right now. Um, I would probably have to say the berry box is my favorite. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's the berry box is over a hundred years old. And I know the lady that had it, it's only been a one owner. She gave it to me to become a art piece. Uh, she didn't want to see it destroyed because it had been in her family. And she actually picked berries and put them in there. So I knew it was very special, you know, to people that I knew and, and it was special to me because it's the gathering and the whole story behind the gathering is is people coming together sharing their their stories and teaching children you know about history and about their culture so it's got uh, strawberries in it and it's got blackberries in it the strawberries are actually uh, traditionally made uh, we do Victorian period type beadwork and uh, that's what are the Haudenosaunee are known for and so those are actually original pin cushions and they have cattail inside of them for the stuffing. Mm. So anytime they, they tuft, um, a, a chair or they tuft, you know, maybe a bed or, or did their embroidery and they had to put some kind of stuffing underneath it, it would be cattail just cause it lasts a long time and it's nice and fluffy and it, it works well when you sew. So, but yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite. So I do see a lot of people spend a lot of time out there looking at all your artwork. Oh, so, so it's uh, been very well received um, for any of our listeners who have not yet gotten a chance to visit Discovery Park of America. We also have a huge Native American gallery um, with all types of pottery and art and um, 
uh, what do you call the things on the end of a spear? The arrowheads. Arrowheads. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, see, I don't even know that. And uh, arrowheads and probably one of the largest collections of arrowheads you're ever going to see. Um, it's a, a collection uh, largely that came from one individual. And then there's some other things as well. But um, I think it's interesting here in our in our area, a lot of people find arrowheads, you know, and find little pieces of broken pottery and stuff, you know, that there was that much hunting going on in our proximity. You're even closer to Real Foot Lake. Um, there's a, there is a um, story about how Real Foot Lake uh, was formed that involves a Native American who had a, who had a club foot or something like that. And, yeah. You know. it, and it translates to Real Foot and so when you're talking about real foot, then that that is the legend of the guy, whether it actually is true or not, you know, I, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, it's it kind of makes sense because, you know, what we find even in our own yard there, you know, I, I found broken off uh, shards of uh, a digger mm -hmm. and uh, all kinds of things, you know, around around the area. You know, if you so the, here's the tip is. If you find an arrowhead in a field, that means that it was hunted with. It was a nice arrow and or arrowhead that they could put on a shaft and they could hunt with it. If you find them near the creek, those typically are the throwaways. Mm. They have some kind of flaw in them and they didn't want them. That's basically where they would flint is near the creek because that's where the flint was. So if you, you're walking the creeks and you find a whole bunch of them, you know, you might want to Look at them real careful and see if you can find that flaw. Yeah, that's interesting. I've I found one on a creek bed before, and I didn't know that mm -hmm. it had been tossed aside. I just figured they had shot something and missed it. Um, yeah, more than likely, you'll see like maybe uh, where it connects to the shaft. Um, it, it's kind of chipped or something, and it's not going to hold sturdy. You know, it's just small things like that that they were real precise on. You know, they they wanted to make sure they had the best weapons they could. You know, because they they may only have one shot. And if you've ever gone hunting with a and you know bow and arrow or even you know a compound bow, it's not as easy as shooting one. Yeah, yeah, so. no, for sure. Um, well, we're going to take a really quick break, and then when we get back, we're going to talk about Discovery Parks powwow that you're in charge of pulling together. Real Foot Lake Duck Hunt with Parker's Outfitting is sure to exceed your expectations for a truly memorable experience. Ben Parker is a fourth generation Real Foot Lake waterfowl hunter and he'll make sure you and your party are well camouflaged in a comfortable Real Foot Lake duck blind, have the best breakfast on the lake and get tips that will have you hunting like a pro no matter your experience level. Discover how Ben goes above and beyond in hospitality and service at parkersoutfitting.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It really does help us get the word out. And I'm here talking with Kim Bug, and we're talking about Native American culture and life. And one of the ways that uh, Native Americans and uh, folks that are not Native American can further the culture and and help uh, both look back and, and enjoy the present and the future is through a powwow. And so we have here at Discovery Park, of course, we have a Native American gallery, and we thought what better place to have an educational powwow. So we are having this. 2023 Northwest Tennessee Native American Educational Powwow, October 27th through 29th, 2023. We scheduled it. It's either before or after one in Nashville. Yes, it's the weekend after Nashville. Okay, so we're the weekend after Nashville so that a lot of Native Americans who are going to come to compete can get all warmed up and, and practice in Nashville and then come here to Obion County uh, and enjoy uh, the very first one that we've ever had. Um, talk us through a little bit of uh, what folks will experience uh, at our powwow here at Discovery Park. All right. So at our powwow, we're going to have it Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday is basically Kids Day, which is, um, you know, 
all ages are welcome. We're just kind of focused on uh, maybe some field trips from schools. We're going to have a lot of uh, exhibition stuff going on and we'll show you uh, some dances and kind of go like a one-on-one, like teaching you. We'll have the Choctaw dancers here and they can kind of explain their heritage of Choctaw dancing. And we'll have uh, the state park come out and bring eagles and hawks so you can, um, see them and learn from the state park, Roof at Lake State Park, of uh, what the importance of eagles, you know, birds of prey are. And um, that'll kind of coincide with the Native American, why why they're so important to us. Now, if there's any teachers listening and they want to bring their students, this is a reminder that we do have the um, Kirkland Scholarship, which pays 100% of the ticket price for students for all schools who 50% or more of the students participate in the free or reduced lunch program. So uh, it's a great way if if you feel like you, your class can't afford a field trip, you know, this is a great way for you to be able to do so. Yes, that's what I'm hoping that a lot of kids and a lot of schools will participate in and do this because it's a a very like it was in my childhood. It was a very good learning experience of how to connect it from the book to real life. And and I can think of, you know, fewer, better ways for us to implement our mission to inspire children and adults to see beyond than something like this that you don't see every day. There's not one around here, right here in Obion County that I'm aware of. Right. And and they don't teach, you know, in the curriculum of school, if it's the same way that it is when I was a kid, which wasn't that long ago, I hope. <laughs> they don't really teach a lot about Native American culture, you know, it's basically, you know, you, you kind of run through it, you know, you got maybe, maybe a chapter or so, and, but this will give you like the whole encyclopedia of Native America. And, you know, you can kind of get the gist because there's going to be so many different tribes here that are represented and you'll get to see all the differences one on one. And you, you can ask them questions and they're more than happy to, uh, you know, if you ask them to take a picture with you, you know, if you want to do that. So it's a really, really good place for kids to to learn about uh, American history. And then on Saturday, there's going to be the actual, a lot of competitions and things out on the ground. Right? Yes, yeah, Saturday is going to be the big day. We're going to start in the morning. You can come at 10 and go shopping and look at all the, the art. We're going to have some really good artists here. Uh, I know... Probably one of my, I hate to say this, but one of my favorites is stonework. And I guess that's just my Haudenosaunee background. But stonework, we're going to have David Farnham here. He's actually from the Six Nations Reserve where I'm from. He lives up there. Mm. He's going to come down and uh, show his artwork. He does antler carving and stonework. Phenomenal artist. He's been doing it for quite a while. And so he's going to be there. And a lot of other uh, people are going to be there from like New Mexico, Arizona. They're going to come from Wisconsin. So you're going to see a good variety of artists here and you'll be able to meet them and know that you're buying directly from the artists. So, you know, when you think of uh, shopping local, you know, uh, connecting with the artists who made it, you know, knowing what their culture is, you know, it just gives it a little bit more meaning to what you buy. So we're going to have that and we're going to have dancing and then we're going to have uh, food. We're going to have some really good uh, cuisine here, Native American fry bread. You now, know, if people were here for our David Crockett birthday celebration, you were actually making fry bread for everybody then, right? Yes, I was, and people love it. It's just really, really good. Um, the kind of fry bread I was making, Lacey Bell is going to make hers. She taught me how to make it, and um, it's more of a sweet bread. We're going to have Choctaw bread, and we're also going to have uh, Navajo fry bread, which is now, just a little bit different. Now, I went to one in Nashville last year um, and literally the line to try to get to the fry bread was so long that I never got any. So I was really excited when you had it here for David Crockett's birthday and I could taste it. It really is delicious. And you put like honey and powdered sugar on it. And yes. I mean, you can do all kinds of things with it. And I mean, I use it even as a dessert at home. If I make it, I'll make a whole batch of it and put it in the freezer and it's really good. If you just reheat it in the oven, it makes it nice and crisp and crunchy on the outside and then i'll just put like a scoop of ice cream on top maybe with like a topping like a chocolate syrup or maybe even some walnuts or something like that and it's super good with anything that you put with it you can do do it with preserves or any kind of berries you can even do it as a entree and that's what the indian taco is so you know if you if you see an indian taco 
but they're so big that you can basically share it with somebody. So, you know, the, the price of the, the taco, you might say, oh, man, that's that's uh, really expensive. But it's really not if you kind of break it down to two people can share it. Yeah. Speaking of two people, we got a shout out to your husband, who's also helping you. Um, let's uh, talk about him a little bit. Uh, his background is also uh, Native American. So. He is. He's from Iuka, Mississippi. And he's a quarter Cherokee. I know his grandfather was a full-blooded Cherokee. They never were registered. So, you know, a lot of people had that conflict of, you know, in that time period, it really wasn't uh, cool to be Native American. And you kind of had to hide that. And that's why a lot of, uh, you know, kids my age or younger don't know about their heritage is because those older folks are still they still have that that feeling of, you know, we just don't talk about it. And uh, but so his family basically didn't talk about it. They went on with, you know, just regular life and kind of fit in to the society. And uh, but they always knew that they they did have that background. Now that that brings up something that's really interesting. As we've been doing this, as we've been working with you on the powwow, um, it's been an important part of this is people that are going to come and participate have to send in like registration forms of some kind that have their you know, Native American heritage uh, on there. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So all of the vendors and all the dancers are registered, documented uh, Native people. So when we say documented, we mean that um, their families have been on rolls from since like the the time of reservation. That's when they started putting us on roll, having roll numbers. It's kind of like a, a social security number. But separate and they they do um, a quantum, you know, to be in a tribe, you have to be a certain, you know, it just all depends on what tribe it is as to what how much, you know, where your bloodline comes from. So there's, you know, a lot of the Cherokees are the most lenient and uh, I want to say the Navajos are the most strict, but don't quote me on that. But, uh, you know, they all have their different uh, regulations. But if you're if you're registered then that uh, gives you a responsibility to your culture to represent your culture in a, a respectful way that people can learn and follow and pass on that culture. So when uh, we want to give people that come to the powwow an authentic representation of all these different tribes. So that's why we're strict about, you know, you have to be registered. It's not, uh, ha it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, whether we like you or not, or it's just, you know, the, it, it makes it easier for an educational program to, you know, have authentic stories, authentic art, authentic representation. So you won't find a Made in China sticker on any of the artwork that's been Oh, no. Sold if here. you do, come and see me. Yeah, it's all <laughs> legit. It's all legit stuff. Um, and then um, I know that we're going to have um, Arville Bird. Um, it will be here uh, performing. I mean, I actually got to hear him in Nashville. He's really, really good. He is. He's super talented, and he's a very good performer. He's been performing in Nashville for a very long time. I know that he, he played with uh, Glenn Campbell. Uh, I believe he played with Loretta Lynn. He's done a lot of studio work, and he's played with a lot of famous people. He, uh super talented. He plays the violin. He calls it the fiddle. And he also plays the Native American flute. And uh, so he he will be performing during our dinner break. I, I believe it's at 5 mm -hmm. or 5.30. Yep, he's performing at 5. Okay. I'm looking at the schedule. Yes, he'll. I believe he'll also be here on Friday um, to do like a little demonstration for kids too. Mm -hmm. And um, we might could get him out there on, on Sunday too if we really – ask him really nice oh, i'm sure we will <laughs> well, everyone will be very nice um and then at six o'clock p.m is the grand entry talk a little bit about what what is a grand entry grand entry that's actually going to be the second grand entry of saturday the first one is i believe at 12 12 12 noon, okay yeah. so we'll have 12 and six o'clock so if you can't make the first one then you better you know you'd want to go come see the second one the second one is when you we bring in uh the native american flag the american flag or in any other flags like the tennessee flag the pow flag to follow that and uh all the veterans uh, are going to be native american that carry those flags and so they'll have the flags in the front 
the veterans uh, right behind it. Then they'll have any kind of visiting princesses uh, from other powwows, which are representatives of those powwows. And then you'll start with all the other categories of uh, dancers. So um, in the South, I know that they do the men first and they'll go through all the categories and then they'll do the women and then the children will be behind that. And it's just a really awesome, uh, you know, they'll be drumming and singing uh, honor songs for all the people to dance into the circle. And you'll have all those dancers and the circle will be just filled up with with all kinds of dancing, all the different styles of dancing. It's, it's really a beautiful thing. After that, um, we'll have a flag song and um, a memorial song and we'll have a prayer. And uh, basically, that'll be it. And then we'll do like a friendship dance like around it's called a round dance round dance you can come in and participate you just listen to the mc and he will direct you as to when you can come in and dance with native people in the circle and uh, so there will be plenty of times where you can uh, come in and experience that for yourself with other dancers and we'll have you know contests and all kinds of other things fun stuff to do we native people are very competitive people so that's why you see a lot of powwows that are competitions is because we're just really competitive people and for for anybody uh native american who's listening and wants to compete is there still time for them to apply to be a competitor oh yes yes the dancers uh you will register on before the grand entry on saturday so yeah if you get here and uh early, you know, before the grand entry, you want to make sure you register, get a number, you know, have your documentation um, there. It, I mean, you can dance without documentation. You just can't contest without documentation. So that's, that's what we ask is to be respectful, you know, of, of our rules and regulations and uh, come and join and have fun and be a part of our powwow because it, they're always really fun uh, events, especially for the native people. It, it, a powwow to Native people is a celebration. You know, it's almost like a family reunion. We all go to different powwows each year. There's at least four or five different powwows going on every single weekend in the United States. Uh, I believe there's one even in Hawaii that's really big. So, you know, when you attend a powwow, you'll see a lot of the same people just because we're less than 1% of the population. And, you know, basically... Native people know Native people, you know, especially if you're running in the same circles like Powell. So, yeah, you'll see a lot of people that you hadn't seen in a whole year and you just look forward to those same powwows because, you know, those people are going to be there. For, for folks who are listening who do want to come, um, whether you're going to compete or you're just wanting to come observe or shop or, or try the fry bread, um, there are uh, multiple hotels all around us. There are three right next door. There are campgrounds nearby. Uh, the uh, O'Brien County uh, Fairgrounds has um, agreed to open up to people who want to camp or bring their RVs. Um, and so people who want to take advantage of that, do they need to contact you or what What did we decide? I don't even remember. They had told me that uh, to give them a, kind of an, an estimate of who's going to attend. I, I believe that's the, like a last minute thing for people. Okay. So I'm, I'm really hoping that people will call and, and make reservations just so they'll know, you know, what to expect. But uh, they can yeah. also email. I think I think we have a, a landing page that's discoveryparkofamerica.com slash powwow. Is yes, that right? That's right. OK, so it's discoveryparkofamerica.com slash powwow. And that's where we have all the information that you'll need to plan your trip. Um, and, um, is there anything else people that you want people to know before, as they plan their trip? Well, for the dancers and the vendors, there is a host hotel. So when we have powwows, basically wherever the powwow, uh, puts up their head staff is called the host hotel. So the host hotel normally gives you, uh, if you're a vendor or a dancer, it gives you a, a special powwow rate. So if you are uh, a dancer or a vendor, they have a special powwow rate. Um, and who is at it? The host Which hotel? hotel? It's the Hospitality House. Okay. Hospitality House in Union City. Yes. Off is of Realfoot Avenue. Yep. 
There are also lots of Airbnbs in the area, and there are campgrounds near Real Foot Lake, and there are brand new cabins that the state of Tennessee um, has built that are really incredible. So a lot of really good opportunities to come and enjoy this this area on October 27th, 28th, and 29th, 2023, in case you're listening to this far in the future. Um, and honestly, this is going to go well, I can already tell, and so this will just be the inaugural and so in 2024, folks who are listening to this in the future can plan on coming to the second annual educational powwow. So we're really, really excited about this. And thank you for all your hard work on this. I know this has been um, a labor of love for you and you're doing such a great job. And I'm so excited about this event. Thank you. Me too. I, I'm really excited about it. You know, West Tennessee hasn't had a, a, a big powwow since the Memphis powwow. And, you know, if you were ever around in the 90s when powwows were huge, Memphis had a huge powwow. And so all, all these people, basically the dancers that are coming um, that are local, remember the Memphis powwow. And that's kind of like what we've, we've always longed for is, you know, a really good powwow like the Memphis powwow. I mean, it brought in friends from Oklahoma, you know, a lot of good singers and things like that that we've known for a long, long time. Like our, uh, for example, I'll tell you our host drum is Otter Trail. And this is their 30th anniversary of being a drum. And they're known all over the world. And they're good friends of mine. I, I, when I first started dancing in the early 90s, they were one of my favorite drums to dance to. And I told Al that. And he couldn't believe it. He was just like, are you serious? You've been, you know, you've been around the, as long as as long as we have. And, you know, I said, oh, yeah, you know, I used to look for powwows that you guys would would be there. So... Well, you and I are both from Memphis, so we love Memphis, but we plan on blowing Memphis out of the water when it comes oh, to yes, powwow. We're going to be the, <laughs> much bigger than the Memphis powwow. I mean, I think we need to shoot for being bigger than the Nashville powwow. Even. Oh, that's so, going to be kind of hard to do, but yeah. we'll do it. We, oh, we, we can, can do, do it. it. Yeah, no question. We can do it. And I need to find out. We really ought to have a table at the Nashville powwow and promote the, this one coming up. So we'll have to work, work on that. So anyway, well, thank you so much for all your hard work on this, and thank you for joining us today on our podcast. You're welcome. Thank you. And thanks to all you listeners who've joined us here today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond, as you just heard. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <music> <music>